thank you so much for joining us here today. We're oh, very excited about welcome. this. I wanted to start by asking. <laughs> <laughs> We're paranoid now. Okay. I wanted to start by asking with uh, asking quite a general, broad question. Um, why did you want to become an author, and what inspires you to write? Oh golly, I have to think way back to answer that question. But I will say the most important thing, and I, I imagine this has been true for all of you as well, is that I grew up in a household that was filled with books. I, I mean, I look at this and it feels like my grandfather's house. Um, and with a mother who read to me. By the time I was probably eight, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. In fact, when I was 10 years old, there was a children's magazine in the United States called Jack and Jill. And every month they published two pages of letters from children. And I subscribed to that magazine. Somebody had given me a subscription to it. Probably at least 10 times I had written letters to that magazine, and they had never published them. And then the summer that I was 10, in 1947, now you can all do the math. That makes me now 83 this month. The summer that I was 10, I went away to summer camp for two months. And I got a letter from my mother, this predates cell phones and email, and it said, I've just heard from Jack and Jill magazine, and they're going to publish your letter in the August issue. And she said, I will send you a copy. So I was very exhilarated. Finally, I was going to be in print. But I was also terrified <laughs> because I, had, uh, I was going to be revealed as a liar. I'm thinking back now. I, I remembered this story, but I had forgotten what the letter said exactly until one time I was speaking at a university in, in Utah, Brigham Young University. And I told this story, and a graduate student left and went to the archives and found a copy of this letter published in 1947, in August. So two things. One is that he then gave me the copy, and it said at the end of the letter, I am writing a novel. I had not remembered saying that. It's called, the letter said, A Dog Named Lucky. I am on chapter 13. By the time I, re I saw and was re-alerted to this, that I had said this, it that was not the lie, by the way. I didn't remember A Dog Named Lucky, but I was not surprised. That was not a lie because I was always writing a novel. And chapter 13 probably meant it was the 13th page of a small notebook. The lie, though, was this. I had gone off to summer camp where I would spend two months in the company of many other little girls. It was an entirely girls camp. The counselors at that camp who took care of the little girls were college students. It was a summer job for them. And I had discovered when I arrived at camp that when the counselors asked the little campers like me about their families and about their lives at home, I had perceived something. I was, I was always an introvert and very shy, but I was observant. And I had already perceived something that these college girl counselors were nicer to the little girls who had brothers in college. I did not, but I invented one. And so when they asked me questions, I told them about my brother. I, his name was David, who was a college student. I was 10. That meant he was 10 years older, I suppose. And they asked me where he went to college. I didn't know anything about colleges. But I just happened to know the name of one that turned out to be just the right choice. I said he went to Princeton. <laughs> the reason I knew about Princeton is because in my family there was a great uncle who uh, was talked about a lot scornfully because he was a Princeton graduate and so devoted to Princeton University that he refused to go to his own daughter's wedding because it was held the same day as his reunion. I mean, very horrible thing to do, but that's why I knew the name of that college. So I said to these young women who had asked me, my brother David goes to Princeton, and they asked me more questions. What does he look like? And yeah, I just created a gorgeous blonde 20-year-old guy. <laughs> and uh, does he have a car? Yes, a blue car, convertible, I said. I was thinking of 
Does anybody remember the Nancy Drew books and her boyfriend Ned had a roadster? I don't know what a roadster was, but I, that's who I created in my, in my imagination and how I got through those first few weeks of summer camp. David might come to visit this weekend. <laughs> he might drive up in his blue convertible. Uh, and then my mother said she was sending this magazine to me, which had a copy of my letter which said, I have a sister who is 13 and a brother who is five. And that's how I thought I'm going to be revealed as a liar. Uh, so when the magazine arrived, I quickly glimpsed my letter and my name in print. And then I thrust it into the trunk under my bed and never showed it to anybody. And fortunately, uh, apparently no other child at that camp got a copy of that magazine that summer. So I, I was not outed. But uh, I was a fiction writer in those days, uh, even to the extent of creating a fictional brother. That's a long answer to a short <laughs> question. And more specifically, what inspired you to write The Giver, and how did the story behind that start? OK, the inspiration for The Giver is probably the question I'm most often asked. Um, and. I, can't, I have to retell the same answer because I can't make up a new one every time. So some of you may have seen this answer in, in print or it was part of the speech accepting the Newbery Medal for the giver. But I will, I will tell it again. Um, I don't know how many books I had already written and published at that point. It was 1993, probably, when I was writing The Giver, possibly 92. And my first book had been published in 1977. And I had written one every year, some years two. So many books. And I was undergoing the feeling that I often have, and that I'm having right now, of it's time to write another book. I don't have a new idea. I will never have another idea. Uh, my career is over. I'm going to die in poverty. Uh, so just a. <laughs> a little routine that I go through. So it was that period in my life, in 1992, when I went, as I frequently did, to visit my parents who were getting old. I lived in Boston at the time, Massachusetts, and my parents were both in a nursing facility in Virginia. I would fly down to Virginia once every six weeks or so. And this particular visit, I first visited my mother, who was in one section of this facility because she needed medical care. She was on oxygen and she was blind. And I would sit and talk to my mother, who was, whose mind was quite intact, and her memories. And we would talk about the past. And she often talked about my older sister. My sister had died young. In fact, my first book, A Summer to Die, was a fictionalized account of, of that event. At any rate, I talked to my mother this particular visit, and then when she tired, I went to see my father, who was in another part of this facility, because he was still up and about, though he needed assistance. And his memory was starting to fade a bit. He didn't have Alzheimer's, but he was close to 90, and, and one's memory begins to, to uh, dim at that point. And my brother and I had prepared a photograph album. So I sat with my dad, turning the pages of the album, and there were pictures from his past and our past. There were houses we had lived in. My father had been a career military officer, so we had moved all over the world. And there were cars. My father was a car guy. There was a car he had loved in 1954, same year I graduated from high school. He bought himself a car he had always wanted. So he would look at those pictures and it would trigger that memory and we would talk about that set of events. In fact, when we got to the picture of the car, he said, oh, best car I ever had. And I said, remember what a brat I was about that car? And he said, you were never a brat, what do you mean? And I said, well, <laughs> I was about to go to college and the college I wanted to go to was quite expensive. And you wanted me to go to the other college, which was much cheaper. And I said to you, nastily, you just paid the same amount for that car that it would cost me to go to a year of this college that I want to go to, which was a kind of bratty thing to do. But I did end up going to the more expensive college. At any rate, so here's this photograph album. And here's me triggering my father's memories. And here suddenly is a picture of two little girls. 
And he looks at it and says, oh, there you are with your sister. And then he looked a little abashed and he said, I can't remember her name. And I said, her name was Helen, Dad. She was named for her grandmother. And he said, whatever happened to her? <coughs> and I had to tell him about the death of his first child, which had happened years and years and years before. Is there a strong man in this audience who can <laughs> open this? Woman, that was a sexist request, I'm sorry. My hands had uh, this on it, that's why I couldn't do it. Um, and so he said, whatever happened to her? And I explained uh, the death of my sister. And he was so saddened by it that I turned the pages and there was another house or another whatever. And then after a bit, there's a picture of two teenage girls laughing. And he said, oh, there you are with Helen. And he said, whatever happened to her? It was only five minutes since I had told him, but now I had to tell him again about the death of his daughter. And when I was driving back that day to the airport to go home, I began to think, and, and this is probably what every writer thinks in order to instigate and propel a story. I began to think, what if? And I thought, what if there were a way to manipulate human memory so that maybe the doctor could give you a shot or a pill and it would obliterate every memory you had that made you sad or scared? And then I thought, would that be a good thing? And of course it wouldn't, but it took a while to, in my thinking, to, to figure that out. Nonetheless, by the time I got home, I knew I was going to write a new book, a story, about a group of people who had found a way to do what I just described. I realized right away that it would have to be in the future. And I have never been a writer of futuristic or even fantasy or science fiction. Uh, but this was going to have to be set in the future. And, and then I set about creating a community of people. And I think I had uh, drawn on my experiences living as I had throughout my life till that point, or, or until I, I uh, got married, uh, on military uh, facilities, on, on army bases. And so the community in which the boy lives is, is uh, something like that, very comfortable, very safe, and also very rigid and very restricted. Uh, I had to create a character to put down into that plot that was beginning to take shape. And as always, I had to decide, is this gonna be a male or female character? How old is this character? But something kind of magical happens at that point uh, because a character appears to me. And I don't know how that happens, but I don't have to worry about who the character is because that character has appeared and always with a name attached. Only once, and I can describe that to you later if you ask the right questions, have I had to change the name of a character. Uh, but this boy appeared and he was 12, which is probably my favorite age to write about because it's such a transitional age. Still a child, really. Think of yourself at, at 12. But at 12, you think you're an adult. You're, you're, you think you're grown, wise, teenage. Um, you're beginning to hate your parents a little bit at 12, part of the necessary progress of growing up. So you're both a child and the beginning uh, of an adult. And it allows for a lot of plot variations. So that was the beginning of The Giver, mainly focusing on the question, the concept of human memory. And then it evolved to become a whole quartet, which has become mm -hmm. world famous. But correct me if I'm wrong, you initially didn't intend it to be a series. What, what made you write Gathering Blue? Okay, The Giver now, a quartet of four books, but they were not written one after another. And when I can, finished the first book, I had no thought of writing a second. The book seemed ended to me, although I consciously ended it with an um, ambiguous ending. I liked the idea of people be able, being able to use their imagination and figure out for themselves what had happened to the character at the end. I, know that I discovered that kids did not like that. Um, they, they wrote and told me so. But several years later, I sat down again to write a book. 
And again, uh, other books had intervened. A character appeared, and this time it was an adolescent girl. And she had a name, Kira is her name in the book. It was the name that she appeared with in my imagination. And the scene that I could see her in was unlike the world of the giver. It was a very primitive place with no plumbing or electricity. Uh, people lived in crude huts. And more than that, she was in the opening scene sitting beside the dead body of her mother. And so that provided me with a lot of material from which to, to go. I did not see it as, the begin, as a sequel to The Giver. How could it be? It's so unlike his highly sophisticated community. And then as I approached the end of the book, as I was writing it, I suddenly realized, because I was throughout the writing of it and the previous years, I'd been getting letters and letters, emails mostly, from kids wanting to know what happened to the boy at the end of The Giver, I thought, I can answer that question for them. So at the end of the second book, which is called Gathering Blue, the girl in the book has a young companion, a little boy. His name is Matt. And he disappears for a while. He's gone for a section of the book, and she's concerned for him and about him. And then he returns on the very last pages, and he's been to another place. He's made a long journey and returned, and he says to her in the final pages, at least on the final pages of the manuscript, he said, I, he describes the place he's been, where people are better off and happier and, and living a more congenial life than this primitive place where she lives. He says, uh, I've seen a boy there uh, about your age. Uh, his name is Jonas. Uh, I bet you can marry him, I think, I think uh, is, is what he says to her in the manuscript. The editor asked me to take the name out, not to make it so specific, so that readers who weren't familiar with the giver and weren't wondering about the giver would not have to make that connection. So the name is not in there, but he still says, I've seen a boy there. He has very blue eyes. Uh, I, I bet you could marry him or something like that. And that's for readers who were familiar and still wondering about The Giver. They made that connection instantly, and, and uh, the fact that that was Jonas. Then more books intervened, and by now there were two connected books. Well, let me just I, I go back to the second one for a second. I just thought of something else. People did raise the question, or perhaps the objection, how could these two places coexist? This place where they're so advanced that in science and technology, and this place where they live in mud huts and don't have plumbing. And I would explain in my replies to these readers who had asked this question, the concept of suspension of disbelief. I would say you just have to accept that they did even though logically they might not. And then an interesting thing happened. A, a cousin of mine has a daughter who is in the Foreign Service, in the United States Foreign Service, and she's been posted to various places around the world, and suddenly she was in Pakistan. And she was sending home by email, photographs, emails, messages, and yet I looked at a map to see exactly where she was, and I realized that Afghanistan is over here. At the same time, I was sending $35 every month to a woman in Afghanistan to pay for the, the tuition of her children to go to school. And they lived in a mud hut with no electricity or plumbing. OK, it'd be a tough walk from Pakistan to Afghanistan and very difficult. But it made me aware that those two Types of places can coexist in, in time. All right, so time passed, and then uh, I was feeling that I could do a third book and turn it into a trilogy. And uh, again, I needed a main character, and I remembered that little boy in the second book. So suddenly he's now older, and he becomes the protagonist of the third book which is called Messenger. 
And then there were three books, The Giver Trilogy. And I should add that Jonas and Gabriel appear in the third book. Maddie is now a teenager, Jonas is a grown man, and Gabe is, is also a teenager, 14 years old or so. No, Gabe is 10 in the, sec in the third book. Okay. So now there were three books, and then after a while, I began to feel the need. And again, responding to questions, whatever happened to, and they would name various characters. And so the fourth book, I began with a teenage character, and it was going to be Gabriel, the baby in the first book. Okay, in the fourth book, he's going to be 14. Of course, every main character, every protagonist needs some kind of quest, something they want or need and will achieve by the end of the book or fail to achieve, but something to propel them through the story. And so I had Gabriel, and now he's 14, and I wrote a section of dialogue. He's talking to Jonas, who is a grown man now with children. And Gabe uh, is asking him about his own past. And he says in this piece of dialogue I wrote, oh, what, what about my mother? Didn't she want me? And Jonas attempts to describe the, the methodology for babies back in the community from which he's come. And, and he describes the concept of birth mothers who give birth to babies who are then assigned to families and I began to think about that birth mother. And she became more interesting to me than the boy Gabe who was asking the question. So I went back. I set that bit of dialogue aside and I went back and re-began the book. And this is where I changed the name of the protagonist who came to me. I created in my mind a young girl, 14 years old, who is giving birth on the first page of this book, and they put a mask over her eyes so that she can't see what she's giving birth to, which will be taken from her immediately. And she appeared to me with the name Mary. Perfectly good name. I wrote and wrote and wrote about this girl Mary, the birth mother. And incidentally, that book was to be called Birth Mother until I realized that no boy would ever pick the book up <laughs> or buy it. Publishers have to worry about those things. Uh, but I also began to realize that reviewers, teachers, librarians, and occasional kids were going to find religious significance in that name, which I did not want to be there. So I went back and changed her name, and her name in the fourth book is Claire. She gives birth to a son, which is the title of the book, Son, who's immediately taken from her. She finds a way to keep track of where that baby is and, and knows that it's a boy. And there is the child care unit in this community. And Jonas is there, he's a, he's a teenager. Um, she doesn't know him, but she's keeping track, keeping watch over this child to whom she has given birth. And then a year later, as we know from the first book, Jonas takes that baby, kidnaps that baby, and flees and leaves the community. So her child disappears a second time. And the entire rest of the book is her search for that child. Hence the title, Son, her search for the son she knows she has. I think it probably was not a coincidence that one of my own sons, I had two, died about that time. Uh, and so, although I'm never going to get my son back, I'm familiar with the feeling of having lost a son, and that permeates that book. I had, though, in that book, to account for 14 years before she finds him. And that's why that book is much fatter than the previous three. I had to account for a lot of characters and a lot of passage of time. And in doing so, of course, I had to create more characters because plot things were happening to this girl making this search. And uh, so although that was the final book, which I thought resolved everything, and now you know what happened to Jonas. Here he is. He's married to Kira, who's here. Now you know what happened to her. Uh, but now I get letters because there are a couple of 
characters in the middle section of the book that I didn't account for. And so now I'm getting letters saying, but what about? Uh, but I'm not going to, I'm, I'm calling it quits on that. <laughs> quartet is enough. I don't, I, I don't want it to be a quintet. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier that The Giver started out as an exploration into human memory, but there's a lot of other darker themes in the book and it has been censored in a lot of schools. Um, wh why do you think it's been censored and what, what's your response to this censorship? Okay. Um, actually, it has been rarely censored and very frequently challenged, and there is a difference. Uh, challenged generally means that a parent comes to a school and says, I want this book removed from the library. I don't want my child reading this terrible book. When that happens, often the challenge is dismissed because of one important thing. The rules for such, addressing such a challenge in the states in public school libraries are, one, that the parent making the objection has to read the book. <laughs> and very often they have not. Uh, somebody has pointed out the paragraph on page whatever, and so then they bring the challenge. So once they read the book, they very often for, forget about the challenge. They, they put it in context. But if they continue and taking certain things out of context, and the things they seize on are a scene in the book where the father, Jonas's father, kills a newborn baby because that's part of the procedure in this community where he lives, where uh, emotions have been deadened so nobody much cares uh, and where population is, is uh, carefully controlled. And so if twins are born, the one of lower weight is is uh, put to, is euthanized. Okay, so so parents seize on that, and then there is another section, which did not incidentally appear in the movie, and I'll tell you something about that in a minute. The other section they seize on is the the children in this community, beginning at oh I've forgotten the details, perhaps at age ten, begin are required to perform a certain number of volunteer hours in the community. I think this would not be a bad thing. They go off and do good works in various aspects. They do gardening or whatever they choose. And, and uh, the boy Jonas, age 12, is doing some of his volunteer hours in uh, what they call the House of the Old. It's a nursing facility for people who have, have become old. And there's a scene in the book where he goes after school to his volunteer job and he goes in and goes to the locker room and puts on a smock and goes into the bathing room where there are tubs of water and steam and it's very warm and moist and he's assigned an elderly woman and he bathes her. It's to me, it's actually a very tender scene. They're talking as, as he's using a sponge and putting warm water over the, the, the thin shoulders of this elderly woman, talking about her past. Uh, it, as I say, did not make it into the movie, but it, it brought up uh, challenges from parents who, goodness, here's this 12-year-old boy in a room with a naked woman. Uh, so, as I say, the challenges are very often, if, if it continues the process, then it goes to a meeting of the school board. And the school board members then all have to read the book, and then there's a vote, and almost always the book is reinstated. Uh, it's been a very few times that it has been removed from a school library. Once was in Holland, Michigan. I don't, I, I don't know if that's still true. That was a number of years ago. And since the publication of The Giver, there have been so many books that, that precipitate that kind of alarm on the part of parents that they've sort of forgotten about The Giver. For example, The Hunger Games, which came much later. Hunger Games is, is an exciting book and, and was a good movie, but it's about children killing other children, something that's far more troubling than a 12-year-old boy bathing an old woman. Uh, but just one more mention of the bathing scene, which I seem to be consumed by. When the movie was made, I think they decided, and perhaps uh, informed a screenwriter, we're not going to keep that scene in. Maybe they were worried about it affecting the rating of the movie. But at any rate, that scene is not in the film. 
they invited me to South Africa, to Cape Town, where they were filming the movie. And I happened to be there at a time when they were filming the scene where the Council of Elders, a group of, I believe, 12 people who, who are the controlling body of the community, they're seated on a stage when the entire community is gathered in a huge auditorium for their annual meeting. And so they were filming that scene, and I was there on the set watching them film it. When Jeff Bridges, who, is, uh, who was uh, uh, the, the, the man playing the giver, uh, and he's, he was one of the elders on the scene, in the scene, he told me that if I wanted to, I could be one of the elders. I could be sitting on the stage during that scene while they filmed it. And to be honest, it looked like spending a boring day for me. It took them forever to film that scene, and the elders just had to sit there all day wearing a white robe. So I said, no, I would opt out of that. And I said to him jokingly, if you decided to include the bathing scene, I could have been the naked lady in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew I was joking. However, before the movie opened, immediately before the movie opened, Jeff and I were both on a number of TV shows talking to whatever, whoever the host was. And on one of them, he said to a, an audience of five million people or however many there were, yes, Lois uh, wished that we had included the bathtub scene because she wanted to play that role. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> From The Giver to Number of the Stars and Goonie for Green, you've, your writing covers such a huge variety of genres. Is there one specific type that you're drawn to or that you, that's easier for you to write? Or does it all sort of come naturally? <laughs> She's describing various genres. And, and uh, you know, the, the Giver Quartet falls in, do you have a category you would put it in? I, I don't like to call it science fiction. That's kind of fantasy, I suppose. Uh, and those are the only books that I've written in that particular genre. I've written a lot of realistic fiction. I've written a lot of humorous fiction. And you mentioned the Goonie Bird Green series. I think there are seven of those books. And they're for younger children. They're all set in, in second grade. And they're lighthearted. Uh, and then I've written some historical fiction. Number of the Stars falls into that category. Although it's amusing to me that it's set in a time period when I was alive, but it's now history because it was 1943. And now I've forgotten what your question was. Oh, is there one that I like better than others? Mm -hmm. um, no, what I do like is, is the fact that I go from one to another because it means I don't get bored. If I were just writing one type of fiction, or, or nonfiction even, uh, after a while I, it would become tedious to me, I think, but by going from one to another. Uh, I did a book a few years ago, it may even be 10 years ago, called The Willoughby's, which was a satire, really. It's a lighthearted, humorous book. And, and I should just mention it here because I, uh, a movie is coming out of it, a movie of it is coming out in April. It's an animated film. And because the movie is coming out, the publisher thought that perhaps there would be a renewed interest in the book. And so they asked me if I would write a sequel to The Willoughby's, and I did so. And that sequel will be published in September. It's called The Willoughby's Return. However, here's the concerning thing. I'm not terribly troubled by it, but this time the movie people, unlike the Giver movie when they brought me over to South Africa to watch them filming, these people uh, didn't allow me to see a script, a script or, or anything about what they were doing with the movie. So when I set out to write a sequel, I, I didn't know how much they had changed the plot of the original book. Now I do, and I find that the sequel is not gonna correspond with the movie. Do I care? Not really. Uh, you know, a book is a different thing. So, and the, and the sequel was fun to write. I'll just describe to you why it was fun and, and, and the kind of thing that's exhilarating to one's imagination. At the end of the first book, The Willoughby's, I told you this is a humorous book. Okay, the parents have died. Million laughs, right? Uh, the reason it's a humorous book is that the parents are so terrible that the children find a plot find a way to get rid of the parents, not realizing that the parents are trying to figure out a way to get rid of the children. Children always win in my books. So by the end of the book, 
The four Willoughby children are orphans, and their parents are on top of an alp, frozen solid, it says, with smiles on their faces. They look like popsicles. Okay, to write a sequel, I decided it would be 30 years later, and global warming has caused the Alps to melt, and the parents have thawed out. And the reason it was fun is because the parents, having been thawed, and returning back to where their children, whom they never liked anyway, still exist, uh, they are still the age they were at which they were frozen, which means that they are now younger than their children. Uh, so that was a plot device that was a lot of fun to contemplate. And also, what things would they be unfamiliar with after, uh, you know, returning after 30 years? There's one, just a couple lines, it's not even a whole scene where somebody says to them, why don't you call an Uber? And, and the wife says to her husband, what's an Uber? He says, I don't know, I think it's a German swear word. <laughs> Uh, they don't know what uh, Google is, uh, and there's a whole lot of stuff that they, they've not been privy to and that they have to catch up on, while at the same time being reintroduced to their children who are now older than they. My final question before we open up to the audience is, in your acceptance speech for the Newbury Award, you said um, each time a child opens a book, he pushes open the gate that separates him from elsewhere. It gives them choices, it gives them freedom. These are magnificent, wonderfully unsafe things. Do you think in today's modern world with audiobooks, so many movies, and just social media coming in from everywhere, we're losing a bit of this magic of the art of reading? I had forgotten that I said that in the, in the Newbury Street speech, but I like that quotation. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't like that I wrote it, but I like what it has to say about elsewhere, uh, because I think books still provide that for kids. And, and I'm just going to give you an, exa an example, but I think another thing that I, that I talked about in the Newbury speech, which I'm now remembering, is that when I was a child, my family moved to Japan, to Tokyo, right after World War II. And I thought I was going to live in a foreign country and, and be uh, exposed to all these new customs and foods and language, and it was going to be wonderful. But instead, uh, I was placed in, in a walled community. However, my father had bought me a bicycle, and, and uh, I would ride out the gates of that compound where we lived and into the Japanese world, which was a world of elsewhere for me. And so that, that uh, symbol of the bicycle, uh, moving out into the elsewhere world was very important to me. And, and that's what I was referring to in the speech and likening it to opening a book. Not terribly long ago, I get emails every day, 50, 60 a day, about various books, most often The Giver. But recently, I got one from a boy. And when you get an email, you often don't know where the, lo the geography is. You know, it will say their name and the email address, but most often it doesn't say the, the place where they live. This was from a boy, 16 years old, whose name was Noah. And he did say he lived in the south, meaning the south of the United States, and that his father was a Baptist preacher. And he said he had just read The Giver. And he said, it's going to change my life. He said, I'm gay. And nobody knows that yet but me. And he said, my parents expect me to lead a traditional life, to marry, have children, go to church. And, and he said, that's, that's not me. And he said, I, I want to go elsewhere. Uh, I want to I do what that boy did. He realized the restrictions of his world, and he didn't know what he would find out there, but he felt he had to find it, and so he got on his bicycle and, and went elsewhere. And he said, I've got to do that. Thank you for writing this book. I wrote back to him, of course, and, uh, and he replied and just said, thank you. I, I didn't know that you would even read my email. And I've not heard from him again, and I never will, unless someday he wants to write me again. But, but that's a way in which a book can 
open a, open a door, I think, to elsewhere. Does that add to your yes, question? Yes, thank you. That's yes. really powerful. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, we'll open it up to the audience now for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and please stand up while asking your question. And would you probably need to repeat their questions to me? Because I'm 83 years old <laughs> and my hearing is not that great. OK. Um, could we start with the member in the third row? And can you just wait for the mic to come to you? Um, so you write children's books. And thus, it's kind of important to think about what it means to be appropriate. So my first question for you is, what is the correct interpretation of appropriate? And second, should authors strive to straddle the line between appropriate and inappropriate? OK, you don't need to repeat that, because I could hear him. Uh, you know, this is going to sound strange, I think. I don't think there's anything inappropriate. Uh, because I'm a believer in free speech and, and that I think anybody can write whatever they want. A parent, I think, can, can monitor what a child reads and has that right and that responsibility. But I think anything can be written and placed in a library. I'm a great believer in the freedom of, of libraries. Uh, and yet I think the people who are best at writing children's books have an innate appreciation for for uh, what a child wants to read. I'm not sure how to answer that beyond that. Uh, I think a child reads in order to rehearse their, his or her own life. And so when a parent is concerned about a child reading something that might be frightening, the child is reading that in the comfort and safety of their own home with a parent nearby or a teacher or a librarian and people who can be reassuring. But when, you, when, when a child reads about something that's happening, the child is subconsciously thinking, what would I do in this situation? And sad to say, that same child, whoever he or she is, is going to grow up and is going to encounter those situations and is going to have to make choices down the line when it will really affect them. And if they make those those decisions and think them through when they're eight years old or 10 years old or 12 years old and doing it in the safety and comfort of their own environment. Uh, I, I think uh, that's the important thing for them. I, 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 I'm very attuned to my, the child that I was. Uh, I think when I write for kids, I'm doing so from my own adult self, but also from, from being inside the child I once was and, and, and knowing what I would have wanted to read and what would have scared me and what would have thrilled me and what would have puzzled me. And all those things are out there, and, and all of them are fair game for, for writing and for writers, I think. Can we go to the member in the third row on the other side, in the blue? Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, so do you ever surprise yourself when you're thinking back on your books and um, sort of di by discovering that you were working through a particular idea or experience that you didn't realize at the time? You know, the one thing I will say is that uh, every time I've written a book and it's been published by, the, and there's a period of time, okay, I write the end, I give it to the publisher and then some months passed and then I, see the finished book and I think, oh no, I could have done that better. Uh, so there's always that, that uh, awareness uh, of wanting to, to redo something. And, so, and I don't go back and reread my books, but if I were to, or if I'm required to for some reason, if I'm asked to speak about a particular book that I wrote 20 years ago, I'll have to go back and reread it. I'll, I'll always wish that I could have done it differently. And, and there will be, I guess, that kind of surprise, often a bad surprise. Oh, no, I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, but I tend to look forward instead of back uh, at the books. So I guess I don't, I'm not going to belabor that or, or spend too much time worrying about it. Okay. Can we go to the member at the end of the last row? Thank you. 
um, and thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, I'm involved with the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust and the Holocaust Educational Trust, and one of the people that I work with credits your work, Number the Stars, as well as Judith Kerr's books, as one of the things that really got her involved in that. Uh, I was wanting to ask you, how, how do you feel knowing th about the impact that you've had and knowing that the stories and lives of Holocaust survivors and victims are being remembered thanks to your work? I, I uh, as I say, I get, I, I hear so often from, from readers, and, and oddly not always just from kids. I hear from adults as well uh, around the world. And I, I, it's, I'm, I'm having a hard time describing what that's like. It always takes me by surprise, and it shouldn't, because I've been doing this for such a long time. But nonetheless, to be aware of, of one's influence makes you also aware of, of uh, the responsibility of it, which I take seriously. I don't, I don't do what I do lightly. I'm, I'm trying to think of examples, and I'm not coming up with uh, anything much. In, in addition to letters like the one from the boy I just described, well, here's another. Uh, no, I won't, I won't bore you with that one. There are too many of them. Uh, but uh, I'm not answering this well, I'm sorry. I'm always aware when I sit down you know, writers sit alone in a room, and, and uh, it's a very solitary profession. And then the words that you put on that page as you're in your solitary space go out there and, and become magnified and, and, uh, and become bigger and larger and more important than you ever realized. And, and uh, that's a kind of overwhelming feeling. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not answering that well because I'm not coming up with a, a good or right answer. I apologize for that. That's okay. Um, I think uh, the question was also specifically about number the stars okay. and um, the impact it's had on Holocaust survivors. Am I right? If there's anything you wanted to say specifically about that. Okay, specifically about number the stars, which for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is set in 1943 in Denmark. And told fictionally about the actual events in Denmark when, uh, when the Christian population was able to sa save its Jewish population. That, that bit of history was told to me by a friend who grew up in that time in Denmark. And I had probably known about it, I had probably learned about it in history classes in college, or high school, but I hadn't remembered it. And so I thought it was such an important story that I wanted to find a way to tell it to, that children would remember it. And that has proven to be true uh, by putting it through, in, telling it through the eyes of a 10-year-old girl. It's made it accessible to whole generations of, of children, and I, I do still hear from them, who, who uh, are reminded of, told of, and reminded of an event in history that, that uh, portrays the integrity of an entire nation. Um, I, I've, I've written a, a book recently, which will be published next month, dealing with first the bombing of Pearl Harbor and then the bombing of Hiroshima, which I hope will do the same thing, uh, bring bring things to the attention of children who, who, rather than teaching them the historic facts, which we all have to be taught, of course, but also bringing the humanity to it by personalizing it, uh, letting them move into the fictional character as children do when they read. They become the person they're reading about. And so the, the new book focuses on certain individuals. And at Pearl Harbor, it was the individuals who were on a battleship named the Arizona, which was sunk that day with 1,200, 1,100 and some young men on it. And so I went through the archives and found the information about individual men who died that day. 
so that they become human characters instead of a piece of history. 1100 doesn't mean anything until you read about the pair of twins, the, the identical twin brothers who were on that ship. Or about the one, it was hard choosing from the numerous ones that I read about, but sometimes one little thing would, would trigger a story that, that made it made me include it. And one was this, a boy from a Iowa farm, Midwestern farm. Many young men were in the military at that time, had joined the military because their, their background gave them nothing else. And so a boy from an Iowa farm who had no money to go to college joined the military. Turns out in reading about him after his death, uh, that his older brother had died, his oldest brother, his, he'd been one of three brothers, his oldest brother had died in World War I. His second brother had died bringing the cows in one day from the pasture and was struck by lightning. So his second brother had died and then this woman back on the farm in, in Midwest, uh, got the telegram telling that her third son had died, her youngest. And, and what struck me was I read the newspaper account of an interview with her and she said, I had bad luck with all my boys. And that little stark statement uh, was so moving to me that I included that one boy. And then there were others for whatever reason. And then in the second section of the book, the young people who died or survived uh, Hiroshima, again, individual stories. All of them, like the fictional characters in Number of the Stars, I could, have, I could have told the story of a real person as I did in this new book. But I, in this case, I created two fictional children. But in any case, it was a, it's a desire in the new book as well for a young reader to engage in a personal way with someone who was affected by historic events and to be moved by them in a way that one hopes will affect their thinking about the world. We have time for one more question. Could we go to the hand just right next to, right next to you? Oh. <laughs> Hi, um, I remember reading your book in Michigan in eighth grade and it being my favorite. And now I'm a teacher myself, and I just have two questions for you. One, did you know that your uh, book would explode and be included in the curriculum as much as it is in the United States? And um, if there's one thing that you hope that the teachers take away or include in discussion, what would that be when talking about The Giver? Um, you know, very often a book being included in a curriculum is the kiss of death for the book because a kid <laughs> thinks, oh, you know, it's an assignment. But I hear again and again from kids that uh, in both cases, or I hear from their teachers, uh, the book The Giver and Number of the Stars are both included in, in uh, school curriculum. Uh, the Giver, uh, excuse me, Number of the Stars most often in about fourth grade. And uh, I have thought The Giver most often in grade eight, but I'm told by several people here today that they read it in fifth or sixth grade. At any rate, what I hear from those kids and from their teachers is that they do love the book. And it's a joy for a teacher to teach a book that the kids respond to. And so that's been gratifying for teachers, the, the, both of those books. One story I'll tell you that I heard from a teacher about Number of the Stars. Uh, this was a fourth grade teacher in Tennessee. And she said she was reading Number of the Stars one uh, chapter a day. And uh, comes a time early in the book in which I had to describe the geography a little bit. And, uh, and the child is talking about uh, Norway and Sweden being nearby. At any rate, the kids in her class after the reading of that chapter, we're curious about the geography and, and that Germany was so big compared to Denmark. And so she put a map uh, on the wall of the uh, schoolroom and she noticed afterwards kids going up and looking at the map and talking to each other and saying, oh, look how big Germany is, look how little Denmark is. She continued the reading and a little boy in her class, I think his name was David, she told me, 
came to her and said, my grandmother called, my grandmother is a professor in Michigan and a college professor, and she always asked me what I'm reading, and I told her about this book, and she wants to come and visit, and she wants to speak to our classroom about World War II. The teacher said to me, my, I groaned, the kids were very engaged in this book, and now a, a professor is gonna come in and give a lecture on World War II, and they're gonna hate it, but of course I said to him, of course your grandmother could come. On the appointed day, the child's grandmother came with his mother. The mother sat in the back of the classroom and the grandmother, a very imposing woman, the teacher told me, came and stood in front of the class and said with a slight accent, I was born in Germany. I was a Jewish child. Uh, we had to escape. And the classroom was mesmerized by her story as she told how her family made their way to safety during that time. Uh, at the end, now I have to go back and describe something else first. Set that piece aside. Earlier, she had asked the kids, she had tried to include everything in the, in the teaching of this one book. She had asked them to identify what she called figurative language in the book. I've never been an English teacher, and I wasn't familiar with that phrase, but it's obvious what she meant. And various kids came up with things they pointed to, which was figurative language. And, and uh, okay, so, so uh, <laughs> I'm trying to put this in some order. Okay, so set that aside now and go back to grandmother. Grandmother uh, tells her story. The kids are engrossed in the story, at the end of which, they hear a sound and the mother in the back of the room is crying and that's what they've heard. And she apologizes and said she had never heard her own mother's story before. Okay, now go back to the figurative language. One little boy stood up and pointed to a place in the book where the two children go to the coast of Denmark where one has a grandfather, uh, has an uncle with a farm and her friend, her Jewish child who is gonna be taken to safety from this place, has never been there before. And she says, oh, it's beautiful. The Christian child says, uh, or, or it, it's described in the book, she had never noticed that it was beautiful before, but now hearing her friend say this, she saw it with fresh eyes, okay. So the little boy describing this as figurative language said she saw it with fresh eyes uh, that uh, fresh eyes, that doesn't mean fresh like milk or butter or fresh bread. It was like she was seeing it in a different way. And he said, it was like David's mother saw her grandmother in a new way. She saw her grandmother with fresh eyes and began to cry. The teacher told me that during the reading of the final chapters of the book, she went uh, and bought a necklace with a Star of David, which is shown on the cover of the book and which figures in the plot of the book. And she wore it on the day that she, wrote, uh, that she read the final chapter. And the kids noticed it right away. So she took it off and she gave it to the child in front of the class to pass around while she read the final chapter. And she said as she was reading, she looked out and she saw each child press the Star of David into the palm of their hand and leaving that imprint in it. And she said she realized that those kids were never gonna forget that moment, that book, that story, that bit of history. And that's, see I've forgotten what your question was, now I'm making much too long an answer, but that's the kind of impact that a book can have and that a teacher, that the right teacher uh, using a book in the right way can have using it as a part of the curriculum, but as a way to engage the imagination and the hearts of those children. She told me that story quite a long time ago, and chances are she did that again in subsequent years, but if those children were eight years old or nine years old 20 years ago, I can, I can say without, with certainty that none of them have ever forgotten that moment when they pressed that Star of David into the palms of their hands. And that's the kind of thing that a, that a writer and that a teacher uh, hopes for, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's unfortunately all we have time for, but please join me in a huge thank you to Oh, thank you. thank you.